All right. Good morning, everyone. We're very happy to welcome you to this week's Institute for Quantum Studies seminar. Uh, we're very happy to have Dr. Charles uh, Stafford visiting us from the University of Arizona. Uh, Charles did his PhD at the University of Princeton uh, and then did postdocs in Europe, in Germany, and Switzerland. And I got to know Charles uh, indirectly because we, we missed each other, but we're both at the University of Geneva with Marcus Boudicker uh, working on mesoscopic theory and transport. And both of us have been active in thermodynamics and thermoelectrics in the years uh, uh, since then. So uh, Charles is really an expert in many body quantum systems, uh, Green's function formalism. Uh, he's worked on uh, not only mesoscopic transport, but also molecular transport. Uh, and uh, currently for at the University of Arizona, and you've been there for quite some time now. So we're very happy to have Charles. Uh, he's, today he's going to tell us about his new work, about the um, work sum rule for open quantum systems. So, 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 so glad to have you here visiting us, Charles. Thanks a lot, Andrew, Thanks for the invitation. It's really nice to be here. All right, so I'm going to talk about some recent work that was done in collaboration with uh, two PhD students, Parth more and Caleb Webb, and we've got two, two papers on archive that are describing this. The main one is this, this first one, which has the same title as the talk, and then some of the technical aspects of how the partition, the observables are given in this uh, separate behavior. So the problem of open quantum systems sort of generically is where you have some kind of system that's driven, it may or may not be interacting, um, and it's coupled to some environment that may or may not be infinite with a coupling itself that might be driven as well. And, and so this is, a, this is sort of the paradigm in quantum thermodynamics as well as in open quantum systems. So let's take a look at this problem. So here's an outline of the talk. I'm gonna talk about the controversy in the field, which is ongoing for about a decade at least on how to partition thermodynamic functions such as internal energy, entropy, and work between an open quantum system and its environment. Then I'll, 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 give, us, I'll give you our perspective, which is that you can construct the local thermodynamics at least for a, for a system of independent quantum particles that are, taught, that are driven in a time-dependent way from the local spectrum, which is something that's accessible experimentally. Um, but then I'll, sh I'll show that Although you can do this, there is a non-trivial aspect, which is the quantum work is non-local. And so when you do the thermodynamics, you have to take that into account. And I'll show that this local perspective uh, is basically the only way that you can partition the entropy. The entropy is singular under any other partition. And then I'll compare to some of these other schemes that have been advanced in the literature at the end. So I guess we're now in the age of quantum machines. Now I have to apologize. This slide was made by my PhD student, uh, Parth Kumar, and he, it's like rather self-referential because two of the six things are from, from me. But anyway, there's lots of different types of quantum machines that, that are envisioned nowadays. So here was a quantum interference effect transistor. Quantum is a large engine, which could also be done uh, with a spin degree of freedom. It wouldn't have to be done with a with a weight and a, and a, and a piston like shown there. Um, cavity QED, nano electromechanical systems here like an electron pump uh, based on Rabi oscillations or heat engines of which thermoelectrics are one example. So all of these different types of systems have something in common that you, you have some quantum system Let's say in the case of you know, this electron pump, you could say this is the quantum system and it's coupled to the, an environment which is, consists of, let's say these two reservoirs of fermions. I don't know if it's better to point at the board or, or use the point on the screen. You're doing great, you're doing great. Okay, so, and then in addition, it's, it's driven and there might also be sort of um, an environment associating with, associated with this drive. So there could be black body radiation or whatever, but. In general, what we have is a quantum system, but which, which is being driven and which is strongly coupled to the environment. That's sort of the paradigm for uh, quantum thermodynamics. And we want to try to analyze the performance of such quantum machines. We know that the whole universe is subject to the laws of thermodynamics. Are we able to formulate 
thermodynamics dynamics in sort of a compact way to describe just the machine itself. That's sort of the goal of quantum thermodynamics. So here, here's the open question boiled down a little more specifically. Is there an unambiguous way to partition thermodynamic functions like internal energy, work, and entropy between an open system and the environment to which it is strongly coupled? So here, sorry for a little bit of confusing notation, but here we're talking about a Hilbert space of a system, a Hilbert space of the environment or reservoir. And then we have the Hamiltonian, the diagonal within the system is also HS, but without the script H. Hamiltonian of the reservoir, and then the off diagonal coupling term between the system and the reservoir. And so really it, what it boils down to this question of partitioning is this coupling Hamiltonian essentially describes an interface between your system and the environment. And how should we partition the interface in order to be able to separately describe, let's say the thermodynamics of the system and the reservoir. So there's a lot of different approaches here. Um, one of the leading early approaches was the so-called Hamiltonian of mean force approach, which is based on the reduced state description, the reduced density matrix. And it looked very promising, but the, some of the main proponents of this approach, so I gotta say the Hamiltonian of mean force is not strictly a quantum observable because it, it contains statistical information. Like it's not a dynamical, operator in that sense. It's sort of a hybrid dynamical and statistical operator. And it can be used to calc to do basically all of the thermodynamics as long as you don't have to worry about this issue of partitioning the interface. But unfortunately, what, what these authors, uh, Talkner and Hanke, concluded was that ultimately it, it, it is kind of a dead end, that it, you're not able to adequately describe or partition the interface. And they concluded that within this approach, maybe the first law cannot even be formulated on, on average. So this looked like a very promising approach, but I, I believe it's, it has proven to be a dead end. Now, master equation is another typical approach that's used in open quantum systems. And a, another approach called the mesoscopic leads approach, which I'll talk about a little bit in, a little bit later. Authors that have been following these two approaches, uh, many of them have concluded that we need to include the entire coupling, right? We need to lump this entire coupling in with the system Hamiltonian to describe an effective internal energy of the system. So that's, that's what they conclude. Um, ourselves, we had advocated this kind of local thermodynamics based on the local spectrum, and we'll see how that relates to the other approaches in a minute. Um, then an early uh, entry into this, into this approach uh, came from this, this group, which has some Marcus Butiker related uh, fellows in it, um, not just fellows. Uh, and so what they, they said that you have to divide up this coupling half and half between the system and the environment. And they were able to show that things worked out using a combination of like scattering matrix approach and and the Green's function approach, they were able to make that work. And then a subsequent analysis done by uh, Nitsan and collaborators uh, confirmed that this half and half partition works. However, in this, in this other paper that came shortly after the 2014 paper from, from the Sanchez group, um, Esposito, Ochoa, and Galperin, uh, they basically showed that not it, within their approach, nothing works. So, they claim that only the half and half partition or that the half and half partition can only work in the wide band limit. But they argued that it's in this later paper argued that it's problematic to describe energy fluctuations. So I'll come back to this issue of fluctuations at the end, but I, I, it's a hard enough to just formulate, let's say the laws of thermodynamics on the quantum statistical average. So let's just try to solve that problem and then worry about like fluctuations and uh, full counting statistics later. All right, so a little bit of formalism, not too much. So basically what we're, what we're faced with is, let's say a Hilbert space that can be divided up, let's say between a system and an environment, A and B. And so when you are doing many body physics, you typically don't work just in this Hilbert space, but you work in Fox space, it's more convenient for calculations. 
So what we need to do is construct a Fox space on this uh, union of Hilbert spaces of system and the environment. And so the questions that arise are, how should the density matrix, which describes the quantum statistics of the system in this global Fox space, how should it be partitioned? And how should quantum observables, the operators, the dynamical observables, how should they be partitioned? So those are the questions we want to look at. So going back to the very earliest days of uh, open quantum system studies, the reduced state description has, has been the primary method for treating open quantum systems. So what, what we do in the reduced state description, you probably know it better than I do, is that we just trace out the degrees of freedom in the reservoir or the environment, and we're left with reduced density matrix that describes the system. And any system diagonal dynamical observable can be computed, its quantum average can be computed using this reduced state description. And within the reduced state description, you could also try to do thermodynamics. For instance, you could compute the entropy of your system using the reduced density matrix using the von Neumann formula for entropy, right? So that is one possibility that, that could be done. And it's been shown that the entropy obeys this type of evolution equation in which there's both a, a flow of entropy and a generation of entropy. And in this case, it's entanglement entropy. Because as you, as you know, in a closed quantum system under unitary evolution, entropy is conserved. But in this reduced state description, entropy is no longer conserved in the subsystem because of the generation of entanglement between the system and the environment. So, we applied this to a toy model just to, to see what it implies for the thermodynamics. So this is just one of the simplest models in condensed matter physics, a one-dimensional tight binding chain. Here, T is the nearest neighbor hybridization. And we just studied this problem in thermal equilibrium in the grand canonical ensemble. And so what if we consider a subsystem of this quantum system by just looking at a single site in, somewhere in this chain? Well, what we would expect due to the translational invariance is the entropy of this subsystem should just be one over N times the total entropy where N is the number of sites. But that's not what you get from the reduced state description. From the reduced state description, you can show using methods um, also related uh, or proposed by uh, Durr and Hanke some years ago, you can show that you just get basically the entropy of a single fermionic orbital, this orbital, but whose occupancy is the mean occupancy. So essentially, well, maybe it's better just to show the, the, the results so you can see what that implies. So what that implies, and here we've chosen parameters to show the most uh, severe failure of this approach. So if we're in the particle hole symmetric case, so the chemical potential is in the middle of this tight binding band, then what you get is just that the occupancy of each site on average is a half independent of temperature, right? And so then if you look at the, the actual entropy per site as a function of temperature, of course, it's consistent with the third law of thermodynamics and goes to zero at absolute zero, but the Entropy from the reduced state approach is in for this parameter mu equals zero is independent of temperature, so it violates the third law. So we would argue that thermodynamics constructed from the reduced state description is not valid. It, it's not it's not a useful way of constructing the thermodynamics of a quantum subsystem. Essentially, I guess the reasoning we would we would give is that. In the reduced state description, you are throwing out all of the information about the reservoir. But in thermodynamics, we know something about the reservoir. We know that the reservoir has a certain temperature and a certain chemical potential. So by pretending not to know that, you generate a huge amount of entropy based on the information that you've thrown away. And that's basically this entanglement entropy. So from an information theoretic point of view, this is fine, but it doesn't provide a useful starting point to do thermodynamics. So our approach that we, we took some years ago was rather to construct the local thermodynamics based on the local spectrum of the system. So here is shown a proposal that we have 
for a scanning tunneling thermometer, but it's just meant to illustrate a broad class of scattering probes that are, are used to analyze the local properties of different types of quantum systems. And these probes can directly measure the local density of states, essentially the spectrum of the system, but projected onto a local part of Hilbert space. And then you can imagine either integrating this local spectrum over, over some small region corresponding to your subsystem or convolving this spectrum with the experimental resolution of your probe. And either of those ways would allow you to construct a spectrum, which for a system of independent quantum particles could then be used to build the thermodynamics, right? You, all the thermodynamics can be gotten from this local spectrum if you, if you don't have interparticle um, correlations. So you may ask, well, why, why even bother with independent quantum particles? Because the problem has still not been solved even for independent quantum particles, or at least this, this controversy exists even at the level of independent quantum particles. So we're first trying to solve the problem of independent quantum particles, and then we, we go back and put in interactions. We've done some work about that that I'll come to later. I'm sorry, what's gamma there? So gamma would just be some subsystem of your of your quantum system. So that could co constitute the system if gamma is S or the reservoir if gamma is R or whatever subsystem you're probing with your local probe. It's very general. Yeah, very general. Yes. I'm, just, uh, I'm confused about the uh, terminology spectrum. So in what sense is this a spectrum which is an operator? Is, is it or is it something else? Yeah, so if you trace, if you take the trace of this delta function, then you will get the, the spectrum, you'll get the total density of states of the system. And by taking just the expectation value in a localized state, then you get the local spectrum. So yeah, normally you evaluate this using Green's function theory, um, but I think it can also, Marcus Butiker also evaluates it using scattering matrix theory. So there's different ways of calculating it, but it's, it's understood that this is what is measured in these types of experiments. And, and we can also do, do it theoretically or compute it theoretically. Okay, so this, I, I apologize for this slide. It, it's quite busy, but it's also pretty basic what's shown here. So essentially internal energy is just defined as the quantum statistical average of the Hamiltonian operator. So here's for a global system, entropy, is the quantum statistical average of well, the entropy operator, if you will, log of the density matrix, number of particles, or average number of particles is you know, average of the particle number operator. And then you can construct in thermal equilibrium the grand canonical potential, omega, which is just u minus ts minus mu n. So for a system of independent quantum particles uh, that's only quasi-statically driven, all of these quantities can be computed from the local spectrum as follows. So the internal energy is just basically a, an average of the occupancy times the energy weighted by the local spec or weighted by the, the spectrum. And similarly for the entropy, the number of particles and the grand potential. So for the global system, all of these things can be computed. All of the thermodynamic functions can be computed from the spectrum. And so what we, uh, asserted is that for the, the local thermodynamics, you just replace the total spectrum by the local spectrum, and then you can construct sort of the internal energy of the subsystem, the entropy of the subsystem, the number of particles in the subsystem, and the grand potential of the subsystem, all simply by replacing the global spectrum by the local spectrum in these, in these expressions. So that's our, that was our proposal. And here are some results that we had um, published previously showing that in this approach, indeed, the third law of thermodynamics is obeyed. So I should have drawn, maybe I can, maybe I can draw this on the whiteboard here. Is that okay? Sure. So I think the zoom is cool. I won't be able to see it. I'm, I'm sorry. So the, the scenario A is consists of a benzene molecule as our quantum subsystem, which is coupled by a single orbital to a reservoir. And the scenario B consists of a benzene molecule, let's say, that is adsorbed onto a metal surface so that all 
all of the atoms are coupled to the reservoir. So that's the difference between um, figures A and B here. And then what, what's shown is the entropy of the subsystem. So of the, of the six site uh, chain um, computed as a function of chemical potential of the reservoir and also for different temperatures. So if we first look at scenario B, what you see is, so at, at large temperature here, uh, a quarter of the hopping of the hybridization, uh, of course, the entropy is very large on the scale of uh, two log two. And then as you cool the system down, the entropy goes to zero consistent with the third law. So surprise, surprise, that, that's exactly what you would expect. Um, for scenario A, something slightly more subtle happens. In, at high temperatures, the evolution is, is very similar to what happens for scenario B, but because there are localized states, in scenario A, there are wave functions of the molecule that do not couple at all to the reservoir. So these states are not broadened um, at all. And it, as a result, at absolute zero, the entropy of those two localized states um, is actually log two, when the chemical potential is, is right in resonance with them. So this we would say is consistent with the third law. It's just a special case essentially of the third law. So that, that's what we can show for this type of system. And here you see both the Nernst heat theorem and the unattainability principle apply for this open quantum system here. Now this is a somewhat theoretical that you could thread your, your little benzene ring with a half a flux quantum that such a magnet doesn't exist currently, but from a theoretical point of view, it just allows us to, to describe um, different, let's say, parameters of your system that would allow you to test this unattainability principle, right? So for instance, here we have the chemical potential of the reservoir is, at the, is in the middle of the homo-lumo gap of the, of the molecule. And so the entropy, uh, as a function of temperature is lower when there's no magnetic field applied and it's slightly higher when a magnetic field is applied. And what you could do th theoretically is that you could cool your si quantum system down by a series of um, isothermal um, demagnetizations and then isentropic, um, it's like a compression, but it's like you just apply the, turn the magnetic field on isentropically. And so you could do, you could cool the system down theoretically by taking a series of steps, but because these curves approach each other as you go to absolute zero, it would require an infinite number of steps to reach absolute zero. So that's the unattainability principle. So we've shown that if you construct the local thermodynamics from the local spectrum, then for sure, this, the third law is obeyed, which is, what, which is the problematic thing about the reduced state description. So that, that looks good. Okay, so now let's take a look at driven systems because that was just an equilibrium system. So for driven systems, um, if the system is driven quasi-statically, uh, you can show, well, first of all, you can show from the von Neumann equation that the rate of external work is equal to the quantum statistical average of the power operator, so the time derivative of the Hamiltonian. And for quasi-static driving, you can show that that is equal to the time derivative of the global grand canonical potential. So what does that say? That says that the rate of thermodynamic work, that's what I would call this, is equal to the expectation value of the power operator, that's that. Now that might seem very uncontroversial, but let me show what happens when you partition the system. Okay, so how, what happens when you partition the system? So I argued that we should just construct the, um, the thermodynamics based on the local spectrum. So I just wanna go back to the local spectrum. So if we have here our local spectrum and we average these different observables over, over this local spectrum, then we get our thermodynamic functions and what we, can show quite straightforwardly is that these thermodynamic functions are quantum statistical averages of partitioned quantum observables. Okay, so typically, so the uppercase 
observables denote observables in Fox space, which correspond to lowercase observables, which are observables written in the single particle Hilbert space. So the partitioning is most naturally described in Hilbert space, and it's just given by half the anti-commutator of the Hilbert space observable with the projection operator onto the subsystem. So here gamma is the subsystem, pi gamma is just the projection operator onto that subsystem. And so we're defining the partitioned observable in Hilbert space as just the half the anti-commutator of the observable and the projection operator. That's just to give a Hermitian operator when you when you project on the subspace. Exactly. So yeah, the anti-commutator is necessary to give you a Hermitian operator, and otherwise, um, because the if you sum over all subspaces the projection operator, you just get the identity. Therefore, when you sum up, and here's for the Fox space operator. So you you take this and you Foxify it to get your your Fox space partitioned operator. And then if you sum that over the partition, it, it adds up to the original operator. And, and as Andrew mentioned, because of this anti-commutator here, each of these individual partitioned operators is Hermitian, which we need in order for it to be a good quantum observer. Okay, so with that defined, we can formulate the first law of thermodynamics for an open quantum system. Straightforwardly, time rate of change of the internal energy. So here, the superscript one denotes the order in time derivatives. So this is this is a quasi-static um, calculation. So it's it's only up to first order in time derivatives. So it's equal to the temperature times the time rate of change of the subsystem entropy. Plus here would be the chemical work done on the subsystem. Plus the rate of external work done on the subsystem where the rate of external work done on the subsystem is going to be the time rate of change of the subsystem grand potential. So that's how we're defining the rate of thermodynamic work on the subsystem. Here is the subtle point. The rate of thermodynamic work on the subsystem is not equal to the average of the power operator partitioned on the subsystem. So that, that's the non-trivial point. Instead, there's this additional term which describes an instantaneous flow of free energy into the subsystem that's induced by the external force. <clears throat> and so then the work sum rule says that if you add up the rate of work on all of the subsystems, then you get the, the total power. But the power, the, the power operator does not partition the, in the same way as the thermodynamic work does. So that's, that's the subtlety. That's what we're calling non, so we call this the rate of non-local quantum work. And you say it's non-local because it can be between any two parts of the system. It could be from like one end to the other. And that's why I also say it's instantaneous. So this is sort of like the spooky work exchange. Is that right? Exactly. <laughs> yeah, so I think it'll be clearer what, what this means when I show you some examples, but for instance, yeah, let me let me show you the the types of subsystems we're, or types of quantum systems we're considering. So we're we're considering two classes of quantum subsystems. In one case, we have a finite quantum system, and we look at a subsystem of that finite quantum system, and we treat the whole thing in the grand canonical ensemble. This is related to what I earlier referred to as a mesoscopic needs approach, because in this case, the whole quantum system is finite. This reservoir might be. Big might be mesoscopic, but it's not infinite. Um, and in the other scenario, we imagine that the reservoir is, is unbounded. Um, and so what I mean by non-local is, for instance, that you could have a force, that an external force that acts only here. So the power operator partitioned over here will be zero, but the rate of thermodynamic work instantaneously showing up over here will be non-zero. So that is the spooky, literally, action at a distance. Right. You said that's not me, not me mediated by HSS. It is, let's say it goes away if HSS goes to zero. So you do need strong coupling in order for this effect to, to exist, but it doesn't require a driven HSS. So if, if HSS itself is driven, well, HSS is a non-local operator. So then the fact that work is non-local in that case is not surprising. But what is surprising is that even if the even if the work 
operator, like even, even if, the, let's say force, let's talk about external force, even if the external force is local, the, the thermodynamic work shows up in a non-local way. And I, I guess you can understand that, right? If you push on a quantum system, the quantum states are, are non-local. And so the effects, thermodynamic effects show up over here when you push over here. And it shows up, you know, faster than the speed of light within the non-relativistic quantum formalism. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. So if you go back one slide. Yes. So um, so then again, again, for, for, for those gammas, for most of the gammas that, that to choose there, the, the IW will be zero, right? And, and because you get this, the work sum rule, it means, you know, they kind of annihilate each other, the ones which are, you know, isolated, probably they're isolated, right? Because they're like singularities of all this. Well, if we have a bipartite division, then basically these will both be non-zero, but they'll be equal and opposite. And of course, if right, we have okay. more partition, a larger partition, we haven't looked at that in detail, but I would expect that most of them, they would be in general non-zero, but they would all add up to zero. That's why we consider it like a, a conserved flow of free energy that's induced within, you know, between the different subsystems that's induced by the external drive. Okay, I see, thank you. Yeah. Yes. So what happens if you average over time? If, you, if it's a period and you can average over time, does it still holds the inequality? Or? So if, oh, if the reservoir itself is driven or if-, if No, the, I mean, if, so you have for each time T, right? That inequality. Yes. What happens if you average over time, if you integrate over the period? Oh, yeah. So the, most of the results I'll show will be integrated. So yeah, we, we can integrate that. But, but we have so far only done this for quasi-static driving. So- so the, a lot of the interesting effects with periodic driving come beyond the quasi-static limit, and we haven't been able to solve that problem yet. Although we've saw we've computed certain of the observables in that limit, but not not all. So that's sort of an open question that I'll talk about. Okay, so I don't want to give you a lot of, of formulas, but just to just to show the most sort of the newest aspect in all this is, is this non-local quantum work. So let me just give you the formula for that, for the rate of non-local quantum work in the, in the two types of subsystems. So if we have a subsystem of a finite quantum system, then we can solve the problem using the adiabatic approximation in quantum mechanics, and we can compute this rate of non-local quantum work. And so what, what this P nu dot of gamma and T, what this is, is the probability in a um, adiabatic energy eigenstate nu to find the particle within subsystem gamma. Okay, so, so if you sum this over gamma if, of this, this probability time derivative, it will be zero because within the eigenstate nu, the particle is somewhere, right? So if you sum over all gamma, then it adds up to, P adds up to one, so P dot adds up to zero. So this really describes, and here omega sub nu is the grand potential of that eigenstate. Okay, so this really describes just the, the flowing around of omega, but then there's also this non-local effect on the Hamiltonian. So here, here pi again is the projection operator onto subsystem gamma, and this is an off-diagonal matrix element between two different um, adiabatic eigenstates and the off-diagonal matrix element of the Hilbert space power operator. And so between these two things, this, this is the formula that we get for the rate of non-local quantum work. For the open quantum system where the reservoir is unbounded, then we use a, a formalism called non-equilibrium Green's functions or NEGF. And we can calculate this rate of non-local quantum work there. So this I would say is the so, sort of, uh, well, uh, this, is a, this is a counter term, but the fact that there will be a term proportional to the time rate of change of the coupling Hamiltonian is not at all surprising because the coupling Hamiltonian is itself non-local. But the more interesting term is, is this term here, um, which again involves the omega, so the, the grand potential just of a single uh, level of energy E that we're then integrating over E. And this, if you're familiar with Green's function theory, let's say the, um, the meyer wingreen formula uh, for electric current, what you see is this looks like a, a current of grand potential. That's what this, this, what this term looks like here. 
Okay, so here are our results um, for, for first, this class of quantum subsystems where we have a finite global system, and then we just look at one part of it as our quantum subsystem. And in this particular uh, simulation, it's really just a two-level system. So we have like two quantum dots that are coupled by a tunneling matrix element, and then we, we are driving the energy level on, on the first quantum dot. And so what's shown here is the integrated um, work on dot number one and the integrated work on dot number two. And here is the integrated power operator projected on dot number one and integrated power operator projected on dot number two. So the power operator on dot number two is zero because we're only moving this level up and down. Uh, we're not we're not changing the coupling. So there, there is no power operator on dot number two, but the rate of thermodynamic work on dot number two is non-zero. So that's the non-local quantum work. If we add these two together, that gives this uh, pink curve here. This is the, the total change in grand potential then is equal to the integral of the expectation value of the power operator. So that's the work sum rule in a nutshell. So the, Thermodynamic work on subsystem one plus thermodynamic work on subsystem two is equal to the integral, time integral of the average of the power operator. And so here we're looking at a similar, it's the same system, but now with a different driving protocol. So in addition to driving the energy level up and down, so in addition to driving this energy level up and down, we're also changing this coupling between the two dots. So we have these two protocols. We start, um, so here W is the hybridization between the two dots. We start with a large coupling. We push the level up in the blue, blue protocol, and then we decrease the coupling between the dots, or in the orange protocol, we first decrease the coupling between the two dots and then push the level up. So essentially it's like in the, in, in the blue protocol, we do work on dot one while the dots are strongly coupled and then we decouple them. And in protocol, in the orange protocol, we first decouple, not completely, but mostly decouple the dots, then push on dot one. So what you get then for these different terms, like the integral for the partition power operator becomes path dependent for this type of protocol. The, um, the non-local quantum work is also path dependent for this protocol, but the total, let's say if you add these two together, then you get the partitioned quantum work shown with the, the, the green dots. And then here shown with the magenta curve is the sum of the expectation value of the partition power operator plus the non-local quantum work. And so they add up together to give this uh, work some rule. And so the thing to remember, because normally we don't require work to be path independent, but if you are keeping chemical potential and temperature of the reservoir fixed, then the work done should be path independent, right? And so if you look, for instance, at, at the partition power operator integrated over time, it's clearly not path dependent, so that cannot be a thermodynamic definition of work. Instead, you need to include this non-local contribution, sort of the flow in free energy into the system induced by, by the um, external drive in order to make things um, add up. Yeah, so Charles, if you go in a circle then, unless you have uh, energy flows, right, then you're getting work for nothing. So you have to have some thermodynamic cost to pay for that. Right, yeah. So you can easily get all kinds of, contradictions, which I'll come to in a minute, if you don't include this non-local quantum work. Okay, so now back to the more standard type of open quantum system. So here we're talking about a finite system coupled to an unbounded environment. And for the specific case in the figure, it's what's called the resonant level model. So it's like a single quantum dot with a driven level coupled in this case to a semi-infinite tight binding chain. So it's an infinite <laughs> reservoir. And in this particular figure, only the dot level is being driven. So in that sense, the power operator is local. The power operator has no projection onto the reservoir. 
but the thermodynamic work is non-local. So here, we're, here is shown, let's see, the parameters are fairly low temperature, 0.02 uh, in units where the hybridization in the reservoir, this tight binding chain is 1.25, and we're sitting at the particle hole symmetric point of the reservoir in the middle of the band of the reservoir. So in panel A, oh, and then the, um, the coupling, uh, did I leave that out? Oh, here it's plotted as a function of the coupling between the quantum dot and the reservoir from zero to one in these units. And in panel A, the reservoir, let's see, the dot level is, is above the chemical potential of the reservoir and it's lifted up from one to one and a half. And in panel B, the level of the quantum dot is below the chemical potential of the reservoir and it's lifted up from minus one and a half to minus one. And so again, um, the power operator is local in this case. So if you look at the integral of the expectation value of the power operator, that does give you the total work because it's the local power operator. That's the green dots in the two cases. But if you look at the local thermodynamic work, in other words, the change of the local grand potential, it is not equal to the integral of the power operator. And this difference between the two curves is the non-local quantum work which can be positive in this case, or for these parameters, the non-local quantum work is negative, which means that you're actually doing more work on your subsystem than the external force, because you're essentially borrowing energy from the interface. It's sort of like a quantum lever. You're, you're doing work only on your subsystem or your power operator is acting only on your subsystem, but because of the non-local quantum work, you're, you're taking some energy in from the reservoir through the interface. And so you're getting out more, more than you're putting in. Or do I have it backwards? One, well, one of these two, you're getting something, <laughs> I'm getting a little confused here. Well, it depends on the difference, right? I mean, if you consider a difference in one way or the other. Right, right. So, right, so that's the point. So here, the power, that's the actual external work that you're doing, all of it is being done on the subsystem. And then here is the thermodynamic work just done on the subsystem. So you're doing more work on your subsystem than, than the power that you're putting in. So that indeed, that's that one that is the, where you get, it's kind of like the quantum lever. Okay, so that is a summation of, of our results, but now I wanna come back to the controversy and uh, uh, the different proposals for how to partition things, because I've just told you about my, my uh, scheme for partitioning things. So let's go back to this paper by Esposito, Ochoa, and Galperin, which provides sort of a framework to also understand some of the other approaches that were put forward. So I apologize that their alpha that they used is actually one minus R alpha, but otherwise this is just, it, it's basically, this is, essentially what they've done. So what they claimed is that we should, for the internal energy of our subsystem, we should take the expectation value of the system Hamiltonian plus a fraction alpha of the interface energy. So where alpha can be something between zero and one. And this, then it, you can use this to characterize several of the other competing scenarios, right? For instance, that paper, uh, by Sanchez, which was, was the first from 2014, they took alpha as one half. And what I showed you, the Hilbert space partition also corresponds in this formula to alpha as one half. But EOG, the Esposito, Ochoa, and Galperin, they also partitioned the power operator. So they said, well, we should also say the rate of, of work should also be partitioned in the same way what we have shown just now is that that will not work for any value of alpha because this doesn't take into account non-local quantum work. So this, this, is, this is essentially the flaw in their, in their scheme, but this is what their scheme is. And then they don't calculate the entropy using statistical mechanics. Instead, they calculate the entropy from the thermodynamic identity. But since they have a wrong definition of work, of course, they get also the wrong entropy. Okay. but we can partition the entropy statistically. So let me go through that. So like I said, what, what, what I showed you is just the Hilbert space partition, but we can do this more general alpha partition, which what would that mean? That would mean finding the 
system diagonal part of the entropy operator and finding the off diagonal part of the entropy operator and then adding them up in this way with alpha of somewhere between zero and one. So we can do that because we're talking about independent fermions. And so for independent fermions in steady state, you can write out the density operator as follows. So a given orbital in this steady state system has an occupancy, a mean occupancy of F nu, and it's unoccupied with probably one minus F nu. And then you can just take a product over all of these orbitals to get your density matrix. And then you can take the natural log of the density matrix to get the entropy operator. And so what you see for independent fermions, generally speaking, the density operator is a many body operator where the number of bodies is not specified, right? It could be anywhere from zero to the size of your Hilbert space. And so normally when you take the log of that operator, the entropy operator would also be a many body observable. But for the case of independent fermions, when you take the natural log, it, it becomes an effective single particle operator with a particle-like part and a hole-like part. And these we can partition in exactly the same way that we partition the dynamical observables. Okay, and so then we can compute this alpha partition of the entropy by taking the entire diagonal part, expectation value, plus alpha times the off diagonal part, and we get this expression here. So if alpha equals a half, the second term goes away, and the first term then just gives basically the local spectrum, the entropy computed from the local spectrum. So that's what this first term would be if alpha is a half. But the second term is ugly. So the second term is very problematic for fermions because, right, the, the problem is in the expression of entropy for fermions, log of f uh, or minus log f can be infinity because their states in your system that are unoccupied, right? There's state high, states high up in the spectrum, which just in statistical sense are, are empty. And so that log minus log of that gives infinity. Normally that's fine because you, you multiply that by F, which is also zero. But when you take this off diagonal part of the entropy operator, then this gets multiplied by the occupancy of one of the other states. So it doesn't give zero. And in fact, it below, generically it's unbounded. And what's perhaps, I don't know if it's worse or, or just equally bad, if alpha is greater than a half, then this whole thing is negative, right? So the expression in brackets is, is positive. This is positive. And so if alpha is greater than a half, this whole thing is negative and unbounded. So, okay, not, not a really nice notion of a local entropy to have something not only which is undefined, but also is negative. But anyway, you can do it. You can do this partition. I'm sorry. Uh, yes. One small question. So how do you go from row one from row two? I mean, from, from row to ln of row. You do like a series approximation of like ln of x plus y, and then you take only the first or the terms or? Well, it's, get the... it's special because of the properties of the fermionic uh, particle and whole number <laughs> operators that like the any power of the number operator is equal to the number operator, like any power that any integer power larger than or equal to one of the fermionic number operator is equal to the fermionic number operator and similarly for the whole operator. And so when you take the natural log, okay. the, the Taylor expansion actually sums to all orders and, and you get this result. Okay, I see, okay, thank you. So it's a special property of fermions. So we haven't, I believe a similar um, partitioning will be possible for bosons, but we haven't worked out the details of that. Okay, so anyway, I hope I've convinced you that anything other than alpha equals one half. So for alpha equals one half, this term goes away. But for anything other than alpha equals one half, we have a violation of the third law. So it, I, would, I would say that once you see a violation of one of the laws of thermodynamics, that tells you that is not a correct approach. Okay, but anyway, the, these fellows, they, they persisted. So in this paper, um, I don't know where, let's see. Yeah, so in this paper, they noted the violation of the third law, but what they claimed is that the failures when alpha, so they claimed, in the, or they argued in this paper that we should use alpha equals one for reasons I'll explain in a moment. 
And they acknowledged that the third law is strongly violated for alpha equals one, but they said that the problems with alpha different from one were even worse than those for alpha equals one. And so they said, that's what their proposal is. Again, from my point of view, you know, I think, was it Einstein that said like the, the laws of thermodynamics are the most general of all the laws of physics. So if your theory violates the laws of thermodynamics, then it's probably your theory, which is wrong and not the laws of thermodynamics. But anyway, these fellows, they, and it, it is a sort of an open question, but these fellows said, okay, we acknowledge that the third law is violated, but we think that is how it should be anyway. Okay, so here, so this is just our own alpha partition. So done for the open quantum system, you, you can slightly, you can express that last um, expression I gave you in terms of Green's function quantities, and you can calculate everything. In this case, we've applied it to the resonant level model. And what's shown here, so the, um, the dashed magenta curve is the Hilbert space partition of the entropy. So just the entropy of the system projected onto the Hilbert space of the, of the quantum dot. And you see it's very small because the temperature is low here. It's like 0.02. So from the third law, we know the entropy has got to be small. If you take the alpha partition, of course, it's equal to the Hilbert space partition. At alpha is a half. So here we've just zoomed in right near to alpha equals a half so that you could see the non-zero value of the Hilbert space partition. But again, here you see it's becoming, the entropy is becoming very large and negative when alpha is greater than a half and very large and positive when alpha is less than a half. And you can plot essentially the slope of this thing or the coefficient of one minus two alpha, which is minus two times the slope or minus a half times the slope, sorry. And you see it basically blows up as one over T as T goes to zero. So that you can understand just from the functional form of the Fermi distribution, why, why, why it does this. So, yeah, that's the word. That's a very bad violation of the third law. Plus, it can be large, not only blows up, but it's also negative entropy, which we don't like. Okay, so now coming back to the thermodynamics. So here, what we've done is our best job of mimicking the um, parameters in this paper by Esposito, Ochoa, and Galperin. The, the only difference is. Um, so they consider the resonant level model, but they have a phenomenological self-energy describing the coupling to the lead, whereas we have a semi-infinite type binding chain. So there's an actual self-energy computed from Green's function theory, but we chose the parameters of our type binding chain so that it gives the same bandwidth and so on as what they have in their phenomenological model. <clears throat> so what I've shown here is first the work partition. So here I just give our um, Hilbert space partition of the work. And so we have uh, these two different protocols similar to what I described before. Um, so in the protocols, the level of the dot is, is changed and the coupling to the reservoir is changed. And so you have the blue protocol where you first push on the dot and then uh, change the coupling. And then the, in the orange protocol, you first change the coupling and then push on the dot. And so based on their definition, of work partition, which I argued was incorrect. So they have used, this is their definition of work partition. So based on this definition of work partition, they find that the work is only path independent at alpha equals one, okay? And again, so at fixed mu and T, the work should be path independent. And so this is one of their main arguments why, well, they don't really talk about work in the paper, but if you sort of, you do the interpretation of their formulas, it, it amounts to this, so that the work is only path independent at alpha equals one, but that is not surprising because alpha equals one, this is the total external work. And of course the total external work is path independent because no, there's no dispute about the global thermodynamics of the, of the universe, right? Everybody agrees the whole universe is described by the laws of thermodynamics. The question is only about the subsystem. So when alpha is less than a half, of course, then they're dealing with some non-trivial partition of the subsystem. And then they, their, their definition of work is path dependent. And so it's not, it's not valid thermodynamically, but nonetheless, they construct using the fundamental thermodynamic identity, they construct their entropy change also. 
And so the entropy change, not surprisingly, is only path independent when the work is path independent. And so again, that this is their, their argument in favor of choosing alpha equals one, which recall means putting the entire interface, lumping that in with the system. That's what alpha equals one means. But keep in mind what's, what's being shown here. Yes, entropy change is path independent, but we're talking about a resonant level model, okay? So if you think about it as just an isolated quantum system, the entropy of that system is bounded by log two, right? So what I've shown here in dashed red lines is the bounds on the possible change of the entropy based on Hilbert space partition. It can only go change by plus or minus log two, right? Because it, it's between zero and log two. So depending on the process, plus or minus log two. So the green curve is our alpha partition of the entropy change. So yeah, so at alpha equals a half, which is the physical value, it is between plus or minus log two. If you zoom in, it's not exactly zero. It's just so small compared to these unphysical entropies that you can't really see it on this scale. And although their entropy change is path independent up here, it is like an order of magnitude larger than the, the bound that you, would, that you would expect to have for the entropy. And it's two orders of magnitude larger than the actual physical change in the entropy. So, so what I would say is, if we go back uh, in the history of, of the problem, this original paper in 2014 by David Sanchez and collaborators, they circumvented this issue of partitioning quantum work, but they worked out the thermodynamics and showed that it worked for alpha equals and a half. So we are confirming that analysis. That analysis we can confirm, but we are showing that the sort of the surprising thing which has led to this controversy ever since then is that the, the partitioning of the work, which is the thing that they, they left out, they, it's, it's not omitted in the sense from their analysis. It's just not, it, they do the analysis in a way that gets around the issue of that. So the, the reason why there, we believe the reason why there's such a controversy over the years since then is because people didn't appreciate this non-local quantum work and that you had to use this work sum rule to understand what's going on. So now I'm, I'm, about, I'm about out of time. So let me just give um, a little bit of a conclusion here. So how, why do we call it a work sum rule? essentially because we think of an open quantum system as analogous to a quantum impurity problem. And the non-local quantum work, we think of as analogous to the screening charge that you have to include in the Friedel sum rule in order to make things balance out. And I, that you may or may not be familiar with the Friedel sum rule, but the Friedel sum rule, it talks about, um, this goes way back, I think to the sixties, right? Um, uh, it, in, or maybe even earlier, impurities in metals. So if you put an impurity in a metal, it binds a local moment, but the, loc but the, the binding is not with 100% probability, right? So that means that the, the charge of the local moment does not exactly cancel the charge of the positive impurity. So in order to make it add up, you have to include this, integrate over this oscillatory screening cloud induced in the electron gas and only if you add up this screening cloud and the local moment, then it is equal and opposite to the charge of the impurity. And so what we're saying is in the context of um, non-local quantum work, if you have, let's say a local force acting on the system, that's sort of like your local impurity charge. And then the, the local work that shows up is analogous to the local moment in the, in the Friedel sum rule. And the non-local quantum work is, and that is the thermodynamic analog of this screening charge that you have to include in the, in the Friedel sum. So I, I've, I think I've used up my time. So um, I, I'll put it over to questions and uh, just want to thank uh, my collaborators here in alphabetical order. Parth Kumar was the main, main person involved in most of this work. Uh, Caleb Webb was doing some technical aspects of it as well. And here's some previous collaborators of mine that were involved in the earlier paper that I showed you. Thanks for your attention. Thank you, Charles. Uh, questions? Beck. I have many questions, but uh, one question that's, I mean, I, I wanted to understand if my understanding is right. So if you have a system, a reservoir, and a, and a reservoir system come, that's linear. Uh, you have a linear coupling, and you have a system and a reservoir. 
for now, let's say that the coupling is not driven and the reservoir is not driven, then there's no problem, right? If you just have it driving in the system. Well, you still need to include the non-local quantum work. Like if the oh. driving is only in the system, then the power operator is system diagonal, but the thermodynamic work is not, right? The thermodynamic work still shows up in the reservoir, essentially analogous to this screening charge, right? Like as you're, as you're changing the parameters of the system Hamiltonian, it's essentially changing the scattering phase shift of the, of the electrons from the reservoir, which changes the spectrum of the reservoir and hence changes the free energy of the reservoir. I mean, the problem is not in the U, right? So when you're calculating W, the right. U is like independent of the... I That's right. So the U, the U partitions straightforwardly, the internal energy. It is really the work partition, which is non-trivial, yeah. Okay. Now, when you're driving also the system reservoir, there is also U that gives some kind of partition, right? Yes. But when you're driving it periodically, then if you average out over the period, I think the U doesn't have the partition again. It cancels out again. But That's true, yeah. But the work has all this time, you have to find some partition for the work. Right. And in particular, because the work, if you don't include the non-local quantum work, the work, the sort of just the time integral of the average of the power operator is path dependent. So that could be non-zero for a cycle if you have a cyclic process. So you would have to include this flow of free energy in order to make everything balance out. Yeah. Right. Uh, okay. So yes, but uh, but if you look at some time in the period, or if the driving is not periodic, then you would have to have some partition. It's not. It might. So so should it be half and half again or? I mean, you, so you for, that for, the, for you, it should be half and half, right? No matter what, what the, the internal drive, energy should be half and half. No matter if it's periodic or not. Correct. Okay. But the work, the work partition is more, you can't really describe it as half and half or not half and half. I mean, it is a Hilbert space partition, mm -hmm. but because of this additional flow term, it's not simply like half and half or not half and half. Yeah. So it is easier to understand you, but the, yeah, that was really surprising to us because it seemed like in this field of quantum thermodynamics, the thing which was settled in the very beginning and never really discussed is, is how to compute external work, right? Of course, you have this inclusive and exclusive definitions, but once you accept you know, which one to use, there hasn't really been a whole lot of controversy about that. But we believe that is the, the cause of the controversy to this partitioning problem. Maybe another urgent question. I think we're out of time, but let me say a couple of things. So Charles will be here the rest of the day. So if you'd like to schedule time with him, please let me know. We can get you on the schedule. Uh, we're going to be going to lunch probably in about 20 minutes because I have to go a little bit early. So we can meet in my office if anyone wants to join us for lunch. And other than that, let's uh, thank Charles and we'll have more discussions later on.